Uh, I'd like to welcome Anders Hammer, who is the filmmaker. He's in Norway at the moment. He's Norwegian. Uh, but he had the foresight and the grit to get on a plane and head to Hong Kong as soon as he understood that these protests were going to get underway and would be a really seminal, pivotal moment in the history of Hong Kong. And also Joyce Hsu, who we saw in the film um, when she was in the thick of it. And tonight we welcome her from Washington. She has left Hong Kong and she is now in the United States. Let me say congratulations to both of you on this movie. Um, and I'm gonna start with you, Anders. Um, there are uh, several junctures in the film, people, uh, imply that COVID was a pause button. And as soon as COVID was over, the movement would resume. A lot of water under the bridge since then. How do you feel now? Is it possible to restart the movement? And I'll come to you, Joy, in a second and ask you this, the same question. Um, I think it will, would be impossible to go out in the streets today in Hong Kong uh, to try to do something similar as what they have just seen in the, in the movie, because they would immediately be stopped by the police. There have been efforts after the national security law was implemented a little more than a year ago. Uh, but, and I, I have not been in Hong Kong, so but I've been following the news and every effort had been stopped very, very fast, and the risks of imprisonment are um, much uh, graver than before. You could get really long time in prison during these protests as well, but this national security law has really changed the whole situation and made it so much more difficult to protest in any kind of way. And I think that was the whole aim of introducing the law. Uh, there was a lot of rumors and a lot of talk during this time when the protests were going on because everyone expected that Beijing, the political leadership in Beijing, would react in one way or the other. There were even rumors about a military inv invasion in like, August uh, 2019 for a short, short time. Um, but uh, they, they took their time, but they also prepared this very well from their perspective. They're basically made the same laws as what is in, in fact in mainland China. So the, the situation is totally different today than when the protests started. Uh, at that time, there were much more political freedom in Hong Kong than in mainland China. Today, it's much more similar. So has the Communist Party of China won? I think we have seen waves in history, both in Hong Kong and in many other difficult, troubled places that, that you could go through a difficult time and then it could still end well. But it's, def it's definitely very dark times in Hong Kong now. And I can't see this situation changing any time soon, but I still think it's possible because it's been possible throughout history. And it's also this point that it's so restrictive in Hong Kong now. It's like every day we can see really bad news coming out how basic human rights uh, are disappearing and how the whole room for um, any kind of democratic rights is, um, it is basically removed. Uh, so I think that can also push the development, but that that's more my guess as a, like a former political science student than, uh, than uh, any qualified uh, analysis today, because it would, be, it would take so much to, to go out and protest in a physical way today. But I, I still think uh, there will be more reactions in Hong Kong. So let me ask you the same question. Has the Communist Party of China won in Hong Kong? I think from the very beginning with cracking down Hong Kong's pro-democracy movement with police brutality, with the pressure from the government, and then until the implementation of the national security legislation in Hong Kong, I think 
the ambitions and also the wishes of the Chinese Party is very, very clear that they want Hong Kong to be under a complete control of Beijing. They want to destroy their own rules of Hong Kong and to establish a whole set of new rules according to their narrations and also according to their values and also beliefs. And also from, and I will always say that from what has been going on in Hong Kong, from the example of Hong Kong being taken complete control over by the Chinese party, we can also tell that what Beijing has been doing in Hong Kong or what they has been doing in mainland China itself is not just going to be affecting the people of Hong Kong, the people of China, but then it really illustrates how ambition and also how aggressive the Chinese party is. And I would always say that what has been going on in Hong Kong will eventually go on in the other countries of the world again. That will that will be influence, influencing every individual across the globe in every corner. And eventually that will become a very, very great threat to our values, to our freedom and democracy. And I think that is what the Chinese Party was trying to do. And they will continue to work on that, to work on, to work on establishing the new sets of rules that influences every individual across the globe. Yeah. Um, I, I encourage everybody uh, listening now to submit your questions and I'm going to try by some technical magic to allow Emily Morrison to ask her question live to Anders. I hope it's going to work. Emily, are you there? Maybe not. Okay, so um, she asks, Anders, were you scared for yourself filming? this amazing film. She can't believe the courage of the people. And I guess we must also ask Joy, were you scared? Maybe let's start with you, Joy. Were you scared? I mean, ever since the police officers in Hong Kong fired the very, very first tear gas bullets against the protesters on June 12, 2019, we always encounter endless and also escalating police brutality during every protest, rallies, and also assemblies. So to be very honest, when I, whenever I am during these protest scenes, I would be scared. But then I think what made me continue and what made me uh, go on with participating in all these social movements and also activities was the courage and also the, the, the determination of the other Hong Kong protesters. Mm. We all are very ordinary humans. We're, we all are very, very ordinary citizens of Hong Kong without uh, knowing how to encounter police officers. We have no knowledge on self-defense or the other methods to protect ourselves. But then whenever you go onto the protest, on one hand, you're very scared, but then on the other hand, you also understand so clearly that all these people who are standing beside you, they will be with you until the very, very end. So I think I was very, very afraid, but I, also would say these are the reasons why I continued my participation. Andres, what about you? You were down there in the, right in the center of the action and there must have been all kinds of stuff flying through the air, the surging of the crowd and so on. I mean, it's a hard thing to be concentrating on filming and also protecting yourself. How did you manage? Um, I think in every, situation I was I was always the one taking the smallest risk compared to everyone around me. Of course some of these settings were dangerous because like you say there were all kinds of things were flying through the air and these uh, weapons that the police used are also dangerous if they actually hit mm. you in vital places and you had the firebombs flying around and and not always being so precise so uh, but uh, I think that I was I ha constantly had the feeling of taking the smallest risk because everyone else would face much more trouble if they were taken by the police I could see that many many times how brutal protesters were handled by the police uh, the police was not bothering me in the same way I looked very foreign and I look like um, a reporter. And I would say that the foreign reporters were treated uh, softer in the beginning than the local reporters. They were definitely given a much more hard time than us. 
it's a totally unfair system, but it was very visible in Hong Kong. And, and the protesters were treated much, much harsher. But that changed during the period. The police became increasingly uh, more um, unfriendly also towards any kind of uh, foreign reporter. So they would push us and verbally abuse us and threaten us in some way or the other. Uh, but still, I, I, I think I, I was fine in the situation. But what scared me was how uh, dangerous it was, because some of these situations were totally out of control when anything could happen. And I think it was just a luck that not more people were injured, even though a lot of people were injured. Uh, many could also have died in these uh, situations. I read somewhere that you broke your nose or you had your nose broken. How did it happen? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it, it, it was basically just hit from bro broken in the uh, commotion. So it was not. Yeah, like, you were in a crowd and your camera yes, was pushed yes, into no, your no, face no, or something. No, yeah. Yes, right, right. yeah. It's this is not a, a strong part of the body, but it was it was not the direct hit like uh, right. specifically aimed at me. It was me standing in this big group of people and then getting a guy in my nose. So it's mm -hmm. um, that uh, I, I was prepared, and then you had all these other small injuries uh, I got, but it, it's still it's um, uh, I, I was more afraid of what would happen with the protesters when they were taken away by the police because you could see that they were yeah. Repeated really treated, treated in a brutal way. And I would say that even though there were violence on both sides, this was in no way a balanced uh, fight. There were, yeah. And some of the, the weapons and the things the protesters were walking around with, I would, I would see more as a, like a visual effect than an attack uh, weapon. Uh, most yeah. of the time I, when I was with the protesters, they were escaping. If they were not singing and chanting, they were mm. escaping and running away from the police because they were really powerful and they were impossible to, uh, it was impossible to win over them in a direct fight for a long time. And that's mm -hmm. in when they had all these kind of weapons and they were a lot and they would constantly come more and more if there were uh, big fights going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I read that somewhere that the, the slogan or at least the, the kind of the direction was to the protesters, be like water, don't flow around the police, reappear where they least expect. Uh, was it a successful tactic, Joy? I would say if we are comparing to the previous occupation movements back in 2014, then it would probably be a very, very successful tactic given that back in 2014, we were occupying the streets, we were stationing ourselves in the streets in Hong Kong, and we ended up being dispersed by the police simply with a few rounds of tear gas bullets and also some police officers. But then this time, as we learned that if we are again occupying some places in Hong Kong, or if we are again uh, organizing several protests as, as, at some designated locations, we will again encounter the very severe police brutality and also crackdowns. So we have been emphasizing on this Be Water strategy where we sometimes organize flash mobs across different regions of Hong Kong. And that was really successful in a way of um, escaping from police officers and also uh, successfully in raising awarenesses across all the districts of Hong Kong. Yeah. Uh, we've got some questions coming in. I'm going to try and deal with them, um, or at least have them answered, uh, beg your pardon. Uh, is, so if I can ask uh, Joy, this is a question from David Short. Do you think that the Communist Party of China will actively prevent Hong Kong citizens from taking up the UK offer of citizenship? Can they actually at the moment prevent people from leaving Hong Kong? Uh, I know that you are now working for a human rights NGO. What what do you think? Yeah, that is absolutely possible, given that with the national security legislation, the Hong Kong police officers, as well as the national security police, as well as the national security agents, has the power to stop any individuals in Hong Kong from leaving the borders of Hong Kong anytime, anywhere. And also with the new immigration amendment passed in the Hong Kong's Legislative Council, which is at the moment controlled by pro-Beijing lawmakers, it will again issue a very, very strict ban from restricting people of Hong Kong from leaving. 
And also a few weeks ago, I think they, the Hong Kong government also made use of public health as the COVID outbreak as a reason to stop all the airlines, all the flights from Britain to stop from stopping by in Hong Kong, which are seen by many as also a tactic to prevent people from leaving. So in that sense, it is absolutely possible. And we are also seeing that the Hong Kong government officials, officials from Beijing are constantly attacking the, what we call the BNO scheme offered by the UK and also the other so, so-called lifeful policies offered by the other countries. So that is absolutely possible. And especially- but it, If they did, it would be a, a real diplomatic escalation, wouldn't it? Because there's one thing to suppress dissent uh, on your own territory, but to then erect walls to stop people leaving is a whole different order of magnitude. It would be, I would say for now, the Hong Kong police force have already admitted that they have a wanted list with, with more than 50 names of individuals in Hong Kong who, whom they are very, very closely monitoring and also watching. And there have been journalists of Apple Daily, for example, being banned from leaving the borders of Hong Kong. However, we have not seen very strong international response yet. So I would, always, so I would also say that this is something that the UK and also the other countries should definitely work on because now not only that the Chinese party has been cracking down on the movement in Hong Kong, not only that they have been suppressing the people in Hong Kong, they're also not allowing these people to even leave and seek asylum or refuge in the other countries. Mm -hmm. um, I have a, just a comment here from uh, Agnieszka. Uh, hang on now, here we go. And then Anishna Paul, who says, I was, uh, I saw, uh, I witnessed the events in November 2019, amazing courage of those young people and all the people of Hong Kong standing with them. The smell of gas is with me now. And I feel so very sorry. Uh, I think one of the things that struck me was how it wasn't just young people, but ordinary residents. I mean, that guy who, who uh, is carried away uh, injured and clearly infuriated by the whole idea that the police would invade his neighborhood and and be violent. Were you struck by that, Anders, how people, uh, the most unlikely people, not activists, but just people were uh, drawn into this because they, it just, the whole crackdown uh, offended their sense of community. Yes, it was very clear when I was following the protests that everyone in the city were affected, whether they were out in the streets uh, on their way back home or to work, or even if they were watching uh, the news. The news were very brutal. We had the live streams constantly uh, where people could watch the ongoing protests live. And and that was totally un unfiltered. So I spoke to also a psychologist who said that uh, people develop PTSD, uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome, just from watching the news. But uh, it was also uh, many, many occasions where people just got caught up. So, and therefore also wanted to include it in the movie. Like you could see that some of the people who were standing there chanting outside the police station, they were just, uh, there and then provoked by the action of the police and they wanted to show their disappointment and also to to show to resist there and there and then and you had that also in other situations where people were coming back from work and then they would go out in their metro station in their own neighborhood and then they would see a lot of police dressed up in full riot gear and that really provoked them and everyone who has been to Hong Kong knows that it's a lot of temper there as well. So people are eager to show their uh, how, their descent. So that was um, that was uh, some some of these situations became also very dramatic because people didn't have any kind of gear. They were not able to protect themselves, and then suddenly the streets were full of tear gas. I think during the first half year of the protest. The police fired more than 16, 16,000 rounds of tear gas. So it's just insane the amount of tear gas. And that stays in the air for a long time. Like when I was filming 
most of the time I, I would put on my mask and I would be fairly okay. But if you don't have any way to protect you, it just feels like someone is choking you. And when that is happening in your home and in your neighborhood and when and if you're just planning to go out shopping, that can really affect you uh, in every kind of way, like both physical and uh, psychological. Jeremy Grant is saying people often make the mistake of assuming that Hong Kongers are apolitical, but we saw, uh, we've seen in various occasions how they've come out to protest uh, way back uh, during Tiananmen. And then of course, uh, in the protest that your film portrays, um, but of course the stakes are getting higher and they have got even higher since you made the movie. Is there any way that Hong Kongers can express dissent now safely? And, and if so, what, what is it, Joy? I would say yes, Hong Kongers could be very apolitical sometimes, but then whenever it comes to incidents or issues that really affect our core values, our freedom and democracy that we enjoy, we could always see Hong Kongers from different age groups, backgrounds, industries coming out together, taking onto the streets to protest against the government and also to protest again unreasonable legislations or policies. And with the implementation of the national security law in Hong Kong right now, I would say there is almost no room for Hong Kongers to continue to express themselves in a safe way because now we see that not only the very prominent democratic activist politicians have been arrested and kept behind bars they have also made use of the national security legislation to arrest and also charge random protesters who are simply holding banners with a slogan saying say free hong kong and aside from that we're also seeing that they have been arresting journalists of apple daily they're forcing the shutdown of apple daily and then as Anders have mentioned that they're also arresting people they're arresting professionals who simply made child children's books to illustrate the movement of Hong Kong without any without expressing very, very strong political stances. And not only and aside from all these arrests and also charges, uh, trials going on in Hong Kong, the police department itself have also, have also set up a, a hotline to encourage people in Hong Kong to report on each other, to report on the potential violations of the national security legislation. So I would say not only that there is no longer a safe room for people to express themselves, they will also be forcibly to censor themselves so that they don't get arrested or charged under the national security legislation. How, how, what do you think, Anders, now when you look at that movie? Does it, do you feel, I guess there was still some hope by the time you were editing it that COVID would end and the protest could re, start or at least some semblance of that protest movement would still be alive you look at it now and yeah um, when the protest started some of the days were very lively and it was more like being in a cultural festival and some of the it was so many protests uh, like from flash mobs where you could see office workers coming out from lunch just to sing some some protest songs and then going back to, uh, to work in the stock market. Um, and then on, in the weekends, you could have really big protests with children and all the people, all kinds of people joining in, singing, and they were making jokes. And it, it, was, it was a really nice atmosphere at times, but it escalated through the summer and especially during the autumn. And I think that process it felt that it was going in a non-democratic way for a very long time, to put it that way. Because I think that everything that happened from uh, maybe the end of the summer until today has been going in the same direction. And I think that the, the development that we are showing in the movie has just continued afterwards. The, the biggest surprise is how bad it has already become. I couldn't imagine, and I'm not like especially optimistic guy, but I couldn't imagine that it would change so fast and that they would actually be able to change Hong Kong uh, to this extent. Uh, the national security law that came uh, last uh, 
a year ago. Uh, About a year ago, Tom, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's very strict, but it's at the same time very vague. So the local government with the support of Beijing can basically do anything to crush any kind of dissent or anything, any way of protest or just political opposition. Uh, you had the mass arrest in January this, this year where around 50 activists and uh, opposition politicians uh, were arrested and they will be charged under the new uh, national security law and you have all these new uh, arrests and all these new bad news coming out of just Hong Kong being put, like they were uh, being changed into a police state. And I think it's already today a police state, but it could still get worse. And so, but that's, I think that was the, the biggest surprise because it was clear that in the, when we look at the physical force of the protesters, there was no way that they could beat Beijing or the very well equipped police in Hong Kong. But I don't think that was the point. But I think that they expected that the world would care more. And I'm from Norway, so I'm following the politics here. And I know how hesitant Norwegian politicians and other Western politicians are um, to voice any kind of protest against Beijing because it's very well known that Beijing will sanction and they will take they will get um, angry if um, they receive any kind of protests against what they see as their um, domestic politics um, being from Norway this is the place where the Nobel Peace Prize is handed out every year and in 2010 it was given to a Chinese dissident and that put uh, Norway in the freeze uh, for six years. Uh, China was really unhappy uh, with uh, the Norwegian politicians, even though this is a, like an independent institution handing out this prize. It really affected the economy and the politics of Norway. So we have seen here that the politicians are so afraid to upset China. So if, if they put out any kind of protest, it will be much softer than I think it should be. And I think we can see that in many countries. Because they, you have seen, if you go back and you look into the statements, you can see that there are critical state statements being made, and there are also sanctions uh, by the US. But I think it should have been much more if we actually look at what is happening in Hong Kong and how basic human rights that everyone deserves are just removed from the people. A couple of people have written to ask, Patty Coulter among them, what about the joint declaration? Now, Joy, do you want to briefly explain what it did and how it's pretty much been trampled on? Yeah, so the Sino-British Joint Declaration was an international treaty signed by the British government and also the uh, People's Republics of China's government when they decided to return Hong Kong to China. And in the document, there were promises made by the PRC government saying that they're going to respect the freedom and democracy of Hong Kong, promising that they will respect a high level of autonomy of, of the people of Hong Kong. And very clearly, 24 years after the hangover and also especially with the implementation of the national security legislation, Almost every promise made by China under the international treaty, under the Sino-British Joint Declaration has been violated. And I believe that with all these violations of the Sino-British Joint Declaration, it is a responsibility for not only China to uphold its promises, but that it is also a responsibility for the British government as well as all the international community stakeholders to hold China accountable for all these promises made under the treaty, because that is not just a piece of historical document that symbolizes something. That is actually an international treaty registered at the United Nations, which keeps Hong Kong its uniqueness and also the specialness. And for the other, other countries of the free world, as witnesses of the international treaty, I believe that all of these countries have the responsibility to also hold China accountable, no matter that is by sanctioning or the other policies. We all have the responsibility to hold the government accountable for all these promises made to the, to the people of Hong Kong. But do you feel that economic and political realities are really uh, 
making any hope of a robust response, especially from the British, just pipe dreams. In other words, this is not going to happen. China is too powerful uh, and too sensitive, and it's just not worth it. I think it is going to be hard for countries, especially the smaller countries, to stand up against the Chinese Party, given that China is now one of the world's greatest superpowers with so much wealth and also resources. It is going to be very hard. And it is inevitable that some of the countries would have to suffer economically or also politically for standing up for human rights and democracy. But then I believe it is the reason why all these countries across the globe who also believe in these values that we share should jointly coordinate some policies to stand up against the Chinese, Chinese party because with us having each other's back, it is going to be much easier for us to counter the expansion and also the aggressions from the Chinese party. And also, I would say that with all the examples that happened very recently with Alibaba and also Didi being uh, sanctioned, being charged and also investigated by the Chinese Communist Party. I think it is very, it is an example for all of us, all the investors across the globe to understand that none of our rules, none of our international rule based orders is going to be applicable in mainland China. Every rules, every regulations regarding economy or regarding finance is going to be changed and could be changed by the government anytime, any day. So I think understanding the fact of, and also the dangers and the risks of investing in China and also understanding the importance of, our, of upholding our shared values. I think no matter how much we're going to suffer, we all have to do that. We all have to take up the responsibility and counter the aggression from Beijing. I think that a lot of people uh, who are horrified and saddened by what's happened in Hong Kong have also accepted that that battle's been lost and the kind of international attention is shifting to Taiwan, trying to figure out, you know, when that, when China will try and move in in, Hong, in, in Taiwan and take Taiwan back, if you like. Um, is there anything people can do to maybe indirectly put pressure on the Chinese government, either to back off in Hong Kong or, and to rethink taking Taiwan. Um, Valerie uh, Pei, uh, various people asked some version of that question. So we're running out of time. Let me ask you both. What should people listening tonight who would like to see Hong Kong and Taiwan at free of pressure from the Chinese Communist Party, what can would, they do? I would say the battle has not been lost yet because this is not just a battle between the people of Hong Kong against the Chinese Communist Party, but that it is really a battle between all these individuals across the globe who believe in freedom and democracy against any tyrannies across the globe, including the Chinese Communist Party. And as an individual, the things that we could do might seem very, very limited, but then if something that we all can do is to, first of all, to understand what has been going on in Hong Kong, what has been going on with the Uyghur community, with the Tibetan community, and then to spread a word of the plights of the people of Hong Kong and also the other people who have been oppressed by the Chinese, Chinese Communist Party. And then another very simple thing that we all could do is to boycott products made in China or made by Uyghur forced labor. And then also as an individual, as a citizen who lives in a free democratic country, I think it would also be possible that we all right to, for example, our local uh, legislators to encourage them to formulate kind of policies to counter the aggression from Beijing. And I would say that is the very, very simple thing that every individual could do can could contribute to. Mm -hmm. I, uh, Amit uh, Pansuria writes, the situation in Hong Kong is dev devastating. I'm a Hong Konger now living overseas. I took part in a couple of protests when I was back in 2019. Um, and uh, the question is about any support groups that uh, you think are particularly good. Uh, so I'll give you a chance in a second to maybe name a couple. Uh, but uh, Jillian mostly asks, Joey, do you feel that Washington is listening? You're there, you're in the belly of the beast, you're 
uh, standing up for human rights and uh, concerns about Hong Kong's future. Is Washington, do you have anybody's ear? Do you feel as if the politicians are listening now? I would say yes, they are listening. They have been doing things to defend the core values of Hong Kong and also to counter the aggression from Beijing. However, what is very, very important is that this cannot be a fight simply between the United States and China. This has to be a fight between, as I have mentioned, every individual who believes in all these values. So it is very important that we also raise enough awareness in countries in Europe and also in other regions. And I would say that is what matters in the fight against the CCP. I want to come back to uh, Anders, uh, but there is one pressing question that uh, I will toss to Joey if I can. It's from Desalon Daniels, and I'm going to try this uh, an the answering live. All right, can you speak up, Desalon Daniels? Can you ask your question? I don't know whether the, it's my own incompetence with the technology, probably. Very sorry. Uh, the question is, what's been the impact of all this on your family members and the family members of the people you know? Joey? Ah, wait, hang on. I think we had it there. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> ah, hi. Yeah, I think you needed to unmute me. But yes, you just asked it. I was wondering for Joey's family that may be back in Hong Kong or maybe for any of her friends or any other protesters or activists she may know, um, what has been the impact on those persons, family members? Do those people feel safe back home? Are they finding themselves the targets of anything um, from the Chinese Communist Party? I'd just like to know about the people who are back in Hong Kong right now. Yeah, so for a lot of us who are activists or politicians from Hong Kong, our family members also suffered from the attacks from the Chinese Party where they have been receiving phone calls, they have been receiving emails and also the other harassments from not only uh, pro-Beijing supporters, but then also government backed people who are coming to attack us and also to harass us. And I think the situation is especially difficult for some of the more prominent activists and also politicians who are charged in the national security legislation because that what their family members are facing right now are not just phone calls, harassments online. They're also facing the risk of also being prosecuted by Beijing under also the national security legislation. And seeing what has been going on in mainland China with all these human rights defenders having their family members also kidnapped and detained by the uh, CCP, a lot of us, a lot of us are worried that our family members are going to go through the same as well. So that is the situation. Andrew, so somebody asked whether you were safe. You're back in Norway, pointed out that your, your film is a very important documentation of a bit of history that there's no doubt going to be um, forked and rewritten and called fake news uh, over the next few years. So maybe you can reassure our viewers tonight that you're safe and also say what, you know, what, what in your view, what can people do who care about the future of Hong Kong and by extension Taiwan. Uh, I'm I'm safe. Uh, I'm, I'm fine. Uh, we had a very strange experience after we got nominated uh, to the Oscars. Uh, uh, for those months, there was a lot of pressure uh, on the movie, and there were all these reports coming out of about how Beijing was reacting against our movie. So the, what happened that after Do Not Split was nominated was that the local media in China was told to, to downplay the so-called sensitive categories uh, of the uh, award show, which meant definitely um, our category. And they would also not uh, screen uh, the Oscars live. And then a couple of weeks went this by. This is when you were nominated. They didn't want to have to yes, mention yes. that. Yeah. They, did, they didn't want to publish it uh, or broadcast it live uh, because they were afraid of, of any political statements being made live on TV. And then uh, two weeks later, the same happened in Hong Kong. So for the first time in 52 years, 
they decided not to broadcast the Oscars live in Hong Kong also. So I think that that was uh, those months for the, was the time when I felt the heat that, uh, and it was very clear that and it was also some trolling and some efforts being made <laughs> online. Uh, but I think that all that was expected and people had also told me that this would happen if if we went on from being shortlisted to being nominated. Uh, so, but I'm, I'm, I hope that it will be possible to publish more stories on Hong Kong. The Telegraph just published a really good podcast series, um, which I recommend everyone to listen to. And I'm happy that they are able to do this kind of in-depth reporting still, because it's so much more difficult than at the time when I was filming there, because it's it's definitely difficult for, for local reporters to make any kind of critical stories at it, this time, because the local government in Beijing will react, but it's also, they're also putting a lot of pressure on the foreign reporters. So it's increasingly difficult to report on Hong Kong, but it, the development is still going on. So I really hope that, uh, media organizations will put the necessary efforts into following and continue following this story, even though it will be different, even though it will be very difficult to have live interviews with many of the people who are still in Hong Kong. Uh, when I was in Taiwan, actually, just before I went and started to film in Hong Kong, and in Taiwan, they said, and it, it's a common uh, slogan there, that they say, first Hong Kong, then Taiwan. So, a lot of people in Taiwan are expecting um, something similar to happen quite soon in Taiwan. And I hope that media and the politicians and everyone else who cares will follow that situation closely and also protest when necessary. I think it, it, for me, it's as a journalist, it's difficult to, to recommend people how they should react but I'm, I'm following the news uh, on my own still. And it, I find it's still possible to find a lot of news and at least to think about what is really happening. And it's possible to put uh, pressure on your own government and demand that they should react. Uh, and I, I don't think Hong Kong is lost. I think Hong Kong is in a very difficult situation. It is definitely historical dark times in Hong Kong today. But um, I used to live in Afghanistan and I lived there for six years and the situation in Afghanistan today is really hopeless. As you can see the news that Taliban is taking over the country. But we can't have this, we can't go through life and just give up every troubled place, then the world will look terrible. So we still have to have hope and still have to think that it's possible to make changes and for the better. Well, I I'd like to thank you both very much, uh, first of all, for um, joining us this evening, but also for having the courage of your convictions and, um, and also pointing out that this is a, a work in progress. China is the great emerging power of the next few decades. I think the attention of the world is focused on China now uh, as never before in every respect from the business world to the military to the diplomatic. Um, and in that sense, it's good because uh, people are paying attention, not only lawmakers, but citizens. Uh, so thank you very much indeed. And there's once again, congratulations for your Academy Award nomination. And Joy, it's wonderful to know that you're safe. Are you still planning to be a teacher? I think I'm planning to continue to work in the human rights field right now. Excellent. Thank you very much. And uh, I wish everybody uh, who joined us a good evening, wherever you are in the world, and particularly to Joy and uh, Anders. Enjoy the rest of the evening. And it's been a great pleasure and a privilege to meet you both. Thank you. Good night. Thank you very much. Good night.